All right, thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. We're very happy to have you here. My name is Megan Abella Bowen. I'm the Associate Dean for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Initiatives here at BCC. And we are very excited about our panel discussion that we have here for you folks today. I'm going to really be very quick because I want to get us through to, so that you can hear from a couple of uh, folks here at the college, and then really get us on to talking with our guest speakers today that I think many of you will be, uh, be very interested in learning their story and asking a lot of questions. This is very much an interactive process today, so if at any time you feel like you would like to ask a question, don't hesitate to ask that question. That's what we're here for. Also, if you want to ask a question and you're feeling a little apprehensive about it, I'm not sure if everybody got them, but we do have some uh, note cards. Feel free to fill out a note card with your question. You can pass it down to the end. If the person on the end of the row will just kind of hang it out there, one of my engineering students will swing by and pick it up from you, and we'll be happy to read those questions for you. Um, at this point, I'd like to go ahead and introduce the president of Bristol Community College, Dr. Spraga, to welcome you all to the college. Well, thank you, Megan, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to Bristol Community College. It's our honor to host this uh, really important event. Uh, it's been a huge uh, priority for the college, and I know elsewhere in the Commonwealth, to introduce students to the STEM fields, particularly female students. And uh, it, we're very anxious to uh, provide women with opportunities to look at uh, the various uh, wonderful uh, possibilities in the STEM fields for you. Uh, you're, and not just women, we have uh, uh, there are opportunities for everyone. But you have an expert uh, panel here that you're gonna hear about some of those opportunities and about some of the details involved. And uh, as I say, we're just so happy that you're here. Enjoy, any questions, and this is, a, this is something I always uh, say to visitors, Please, 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 please do not leave today uh, without having every one of your questions asked, okay? Don't be shy. Don't, you don't want to be leaving and going home and say, gee, I, I was too shy or I, I thought it was a silly question and I didn't ask it. No such thing, right? Ask them and you've got the experts here that will uh, provide you with uh, uh, outstanding answers and uh, the information that you receive I hope you'll take with you and move on as you consider careers in these wonderful fields thank you very much I'm going to uh, I also want to thank Megan Abella Bowen and Amanda Donovan uh, for helping to stage this event and arranging it it's not easy to get so many schools involved I want to thank your uh, faculty and staff uh, for uh, allowing you to come and uh, arranging for you to come. It's not easy, as you found out this morning, getting here. Uh, but thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it back to, uh, to uh, 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 Professor uh, and all of the, well, all of the panel. I guess we're gonna be moving forward, but I'll let Megan Abella Bowen uh, uh, introduce and take us on our journey. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear us well enough in the back? Yes. Okay, just making sure. All right, the next person I just want to say a few words is our associate VP, uh, Anna Gayette. Dr. Gayette has her background in chemistry, so I thought she'd be an excellent person to just say a few words for you folks today. Hi, how are you? Good. Great to see so many of you in here. It's great to see that the torch of science and technology is being passed. Uh, I have it at home. One of the girls in blue back there is my daughter. So <laughs> second generation science and technology person. Um, I started in Argentina in a family that didn't have any college grads. My mother had an elementary school degree. My father had a high school diploma. And here I was liking math and science. And it was a little bit weird First of all, because of, well, Argentina being a very traditional society, and also because I was the first one in my family to even think about college. Well, long story short, I finished my undergrad at the university in Buenos Aires, and then I was invited to come to UMass Amherst to do my PhD. So what was I gonna work on? I decided to go into theoretical chemistry. If somebody would have told me when I was in your seats that I was gonna be working in theoretical chemistry and some stuff that ended up being published internationally in some like really 
top of the line research, I would have gone, eh, ah, you're dreaming. But the reality is that whatever you set out to do, there's a way to find your road and get there and do it. Some people say the sky's the limit. I say that that is wrong because some of you may be interested in astrophysics or in, I don't know, interstellar dynamics or things like that. So not even the sky is the limit. But you have to start putting the building blocks early on. So don't let people tell you, well, you don't need to concentrate on math. Nah, you can do that later. No, don't let it go. You really need to focus, focus, focus. Plan, dream big, and with work, energy and the support of your network of peers, family, friends, you'll make it. You cannot even dream how far you can go if you stick to your dreams and if you really put the work that is needed in there. So don't give up, hold on, come to BCC, we're here for you. And congratulations on taking the time to be here dreaming about math and science. Thank you for coming. All right, the next person I'd like to bring up is our, I apologize, uh, I don't have my glasses on, our, <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> um, our state representative, Carol Fiola. She is gonna be here to talk a little bit about uh, the importance of why you're here today and how the state helps us and supports these kinds of programs here at the college. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on Carol, she served, Oh my gosh, that was a little bigger than I wanted it to be. She served since 2013 in the uh, legislature representing the 6th Bristol District, including where we are today here in Fall River. She served for 10 years as a member of the Governor's Council, a lifelong resident of Fall River, uh, a UMass Amherst grad, and a proud mother of two daughters. She's just going to come up and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You did not come to hear me speak today, but I ran into one of the program organizers, Amanda Donovan, last week at an event. Um, and she told me what was happening here today at BCC, and I was uh, very excited. As a legislator, and that's a lesson for another day uh, to, to get into that, um, we plan legislation, we put together our budgets, we fund programs, we fund community colleges like this amazing institute here in Fall River, one of the leading community colleges in the Commonwealth, and we fund programs uh, that are then in turned into grants to support special programs like the STEM Center here at Bristol Community College. But we don't always get a chance to see it in action. People ask us, oh, support this program. And we don't get to really watch how that money is used. And I can tell you just, I won't be here with you this morning, I've got to be somewhere else, but I am so impressed. Uh, I did not come from a STEM background, uh, thus I am a state representative <laughs> and legislator. But I still serve as a woman in an industry and in a business that is well underserved by women. Well underserved. And nothing highlights that more than the STEM industry. Today, the economy is very different than it was when your grandparents went to work in the factories or wherever they worked. They didn't need to know what you need to know to be successful in this new economy. And so the STEM areas are the ones that are going to get you the careers, the lifestyles, and the satisfaction of a great life ahead. And um, these women here, I, I, I tip my hat to. Um, I, would, I would leave you, though, with one suggestion today. If you did not get this sheet with biographies of the panel, I would, I would make sure you do. You're going to need a mentor along the way. You look at every successful woman, and I hope they'll get into this at some point, how did they end up where they are? They're in an industry that is still so underserved, 17% women, 20% women, um, of course nurses and such that require, uh, my daughter's an ICU nurse, require all these skills as well, great professions, more served by women you know, than, than probably most of the other. Uh, accounting served by uh, women more than men, but other than that, you don't see it. I walked through one of our four-year institutions here, UMass uh, Dartmouth, um, uh, last year, and I was on a tour, 
and I walked by a, a, a classroom that was packed, as many of, as, as are you here today. And I looked in and I said, oh, what class is that? The, the board was going and everybody was attentive and they said, oh, that's a chemistry class. I said, oh, why are there only about four women I can see and everybody else was a guy? And that didn't sit well with me. And so I applaud you for having the interest. I hope you'll mentor middle school young women while they are going through those awkward years and feeling it's stupid to like math and science because fast forward, these ladies here are gonna tell you how unstupid it is when you look at their biographies, you look at their lifestyle, you look at their job satisfaction. And um, so I applaud you for being here. Take away the fact that um, the STEM is where your future lies. And it's not for everyone. Like I said, you can find a career if that's like, like I have along the way in marketing and sales and those things. But if you have any inclination, follow your dreams because we need you for the next frontier. So I welcome you. I thank you for being here. And I thank Bristol Community College, President Jack Sprager for all you've done. I met some of your students here today that are, I met four of them, one going off to an aeronautical something school. And again, it's because that's not my business. It's not my industry. I'm saying, thank God you're doing that. Someone else going to bioengineering right here from Bristol Community College. So if any of you are coming here, you've made a very wise decision for your families. You're gonna get two years of an excellent education that is gonna open the doors for you to have an affordable future. So I thank you all, thank you President Sprague, thank you all for running this and it's an honor and I, um, I admire you women here today and I know they're gonna get so much out of it. So thank you. get you guys going here very quickly with the panel. The only thing I want to do is I'd ask for my women and engineers, please stand up and just wave real quick. These are the young women Carol was just speaking about. They're going to be sitting at tables at lunch today. You want to talk to them about where they're going, what they're doing. They all are in STEM careers. They're all planning on going off to colleges in math, science, engineering, and technology. Also, my faculty who are here today, if you guys just kind of want to raise your hand, some of them are going to be with us at lunch today. They are also here to talk with you about that. And then I want to thank our administrators who are here today who helped make this possible. I saw Anthony in the back. I saw VP Greg. I saw Sarah, uh, Dean Sarah Morell were here. So I want to thank you folks for all of your support of what we do today. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Amanda and we're gonna get you guys going. Again, remember, this is gonna be very interactive. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. Let's get the conversation going because there may be questions we're not even aware of that you have that these women here can answer for you today. Good morning. My name is Amanda Donovan and I'm the director of the CVTE Linkage Program here at Bristol Community College. And I have the true pleasure of walking you, you through all of the uh, wonderful panelists' backgrounds uh, this morning. Um, so without further ado, our first panelist is Kimberly Francis, who is the director of engineering for the Cushionet Company, where she is responsible for an $8 million operating budget to improve and maintain a 225,000 square foot, 24 hour manufacturing facility. A cushionet manufactures sporting goods, primarily for the golf enthusiasts. The plant she oversees manufactures 325,000 balls per day over 24 hours. Mrs. Fr Ms. Francis is directly involved in new equipment design and documentation, process and equipment improvements, data monitoring and ongoing maintenance for over 790 assets in our plant. Please join me in welcoming Kimberly Francis. I went through that high school studies program and I finished up um, in my
high school career, I also thought about architecture as a career choice. Again, I went to another summer program that introduced me to, to architecture. But when I got to MIT, I decided, nah, that wasn't for me, uh, which was good, because it forced me to actually make a choice amongst you know, something that I was uh, more happy with, which was computer science and engineering. I made it computer science. Um, I ended up finishing MIT after a few years and then going to Georgia Tech for a master's degree in electrical engineering. Uh, those things, those choices that you make uh, along the line usually have to do with what you like or where you are in your, you know, in your progression of growth. And uh, at that time, for me, making the choice to go to MIT was the right one. Since I, uh, when I graduated from MIT, I took a job with um, Exxon Mobil Company. So I left Massachusetts, me, me being a New Englander, and traveled to uh, Houston, Texas. It was hot. <laughs> it was hot all the time. Uh, from Houston, I um, moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana with the company. There's a lot to do in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. But they do make a lot of gas and oil there, so it's very, uh, it's very much uh, in Exxon Mobil's territory. From there, I left Exxon and went to Polaroid, which was back up home, close to family, a lot more comfortable. After a while, Polaroid dissolved in kind of a heap of, of mess because everyone got digital and no one needed instant cameras anymore. And then I joined the Pushkin Company, which again, close to home, close to family. So some of the choices I made were around the family and where I was in, in my career. Also, you can make choices around finances. You know, do I want to take a scholarship or go someplace else that might be a better fit for me that I, where I don't have a scholarship? Maybe it's mentorship. Maybe you know somebody at a certain company that's going to help you get through and navigate that company. That's another good reason. Uh, maybe it's, again, location. Maybe I want to be in D.C. Maybe I want to be in Atlanta. But those are some of the choices that come to you as you go through this process. Another thing that I think is important, especially now as you have those choices, is to focus on some diligence, right? All of you have a lot more information than we had when we made choices through the internet, through social media. You have a lot of opportunity to find out about what you're getting into. So if you're offered an opportunity to, to be in a graduate program at some other school. Maybe you go online and talk to some people and figure out you know, what's good, what's bad about it before you commit to those decisions. And, uh, and again, just the use of the internet and doing your research uh, is, a, is a really important step. The last thing that I think is really important is, especially as you go through your career, things change. Responsibilities change. You can reinvent yourself. So if you start out today being a computer scientist, and after a while you either get tired of it or it no longer is appealing to you, you could turn around and become an astrophysicist. Uh, almost every school now, every technical school, puts their entire courseware online. If you don't believe me, go to MIT, OCW, online courseware. Every single course I took is online with the, with the um, questions, with the tests, with the problem sets. The only thing you don't have is a professor in front of you, but you can learn it yourself the same way I had to learn it. So it's real important to understand that even after 35 years in the industry, I could change my mind and do something else within a sort of short, really short amount of time. is Dr. Ali Galanis. Ali received her PhD in Cellular and Molecular Medicine from John Hopkins School of Medicine in 2014. Her research, also called thesis, focused on overcoming resistance to targeted therapy in acute myeloid leukemia. 
She is currently working as a postdoctoral research fellow at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where she researches new treatments for lung cancer. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ali Galanis. who want me to help them with their clinical trials. 
Um, my favorite thing that I get to do is I can call a surgery department and say, hey, I'd really like to work on some human bone marrow. And then a nurse comes over with a big, bloody, gooey bag of human bone marrow fresh out of a patient. And I get to stick it in a plastic dish and see if I can grow it. And then I get to do experiments with it. Uh, if my boss ever has a really interesting leukemia patient come in, he takes as much of their blood from them that he can get before they die, and then I get to study it. So this is what I do every day, and it's pretty cool. Um, but I think another important thing to take away is you don't need a PhD to do this. So if this is really cool to you, but the idea of being in school for 10 more years is terrifying, don't do it. I work every day with people with bachelor's degrees, even some crazy high school students, people with masters, and we all work together. Basically, the difference in your degrees is just a difference of intellectual freedom, independence, or responsibility, that sort of thing. Um, but I think the other important thing that I've heard a lot of us say so far that is really important is like, I never expected to see myself doing this. And I think that's something that we really need to stop doing because there's no reason that all of you shouldn't picture yourselves doing anything that we're doing here. It's a lot scarier here than it is on this side, um, but you can absolutely do any of those things. So really just find yourself a good mentor, do it, listen to what they say, um, you can really do it. So at this time, we're just going to pause and see if the audience has any questions um, for the first two panelists. Don't be shy, as President Sprague did say. Um, don't leave here without getting your questions answered. It's very important. This is a wonderful opportunity for you. In the back. questions. I'm just going to repeat it in the microphone um, so that the audience can hear. In the middle. So the question was, what do you consider the worst part of your job? Uh, there are a few. I left them out. Um, so really, I think the, the thing that, do, that I don't really like about science is um, sometimes it's competitive. And I don't mean within the, the lab. My coworkers are awesome. We all work together. But it's a competition every single day for who can get the most grant money, who can publish a paper faster, who can get their paper published in the best journal. Um, and for me, I just sort of geek out and like to do experiments. And that's what I like to do. I don't like to compete. Uh, so that, for me, is is hard, but it's nothing that any of you can't handle. You just do it. In the front. Um, I have a question for you, Lily. So, um, did, it, like, did anyone like try to tell you that you couldn't go into like engineering? Was that hard to go into engineering? Well, interestingly enough, that same guidance counselor who told me to go to the high school studies program also told me that I probably wouldn't get into MIT, so, <laughs> so it was kind of a dichotomy there. But um, over over time, I think you know, people realize that you don't need to be the superstar, you know, to be an engineer or a scientist. You just you need to be disciplined. Uh, you do need to grasp concepts, mathematical concepts, scientific concepts. But as long as you're diligent about your homework and you know, keeping on top of your studies. 
And we'll take one more question before we move on to the next panelist, and then at the end we'll open up for additional questions. So, in the middle. Thank you. Our next panelist, Courtney Kennedy, graduated from Bristol Community College in May of 2014. While attending BCC, she began an internship with Aquabotics that turned into a full-time position upon completion of her degree. Since then, she has been working as an engineer where she builds and assists with the designs of underwater robotics. Please join me in welcoming Courtney Kennedy. Testing, which is pretty much just taking 
samples out of one container and putting it in another over and over and over again all day long, which didn't really meet my requirements of working with animals. I'd rather not count fish with fishermen on the boat all day or sit at a bench. So I was actually feeling very defeated and depressed. I felt like I had just wasted so much money and everything on schooling. And finally, I sat down with my, um, my now husband and talked about it and tried to figure out where I could go with my career and what I could do. So he pushed me to go back to school, go into engineering, talk to his old advisor, Megan, and figure out what I could do. So I finally sat down with Megan, went through everything, and she told me that with my background in marine biology, if I went into engineering, they would complement each other very nicely and I could um, build all my skill sets and find something that would work for me. So I finally was, I'll do it. I'll start in the fall, sign right up. I got into electromechanical engineering because I figured I don't really know anything about engineering, so I might as well get the best of both worlds and figure out what I want to do. I fell in love with all my electrical classes. I was pretty much the only girl in any of those classes, but it was amazing. People were coming to me to ask me questions because I actually knew what I was doing and enjoyed it. Um, I, it was a long process, but I, I did finish in two years with my associate's degree in electromechanical engineering. And while I was in school for the last few months, I began looking for an internship. Because I found out from the previous school, if you have no experience, no one wants to hire you. So I ended up hearing about a position for working with underwater robotics at a local company called Aquabotics. And I went in after he approved my resume and talked to him, just very down to earth, told him I have no experience, I've only taken some electrical classes, but I'm a fast learner. Show me what you want me to do, I'll do it. He ended up hiring me on the spot. And liked my personality and just was like, okay, we'll work with this. On one of my first days of work, he gave me a wiring diagram, which I don't know if you guys have seen one of those before. A piece of paper and just wires going everywhere. And he gave me a power box for one of the vehicles and goes, here, wire it, figure it out. <laughs> Again, only some school experience. I was like, all right, I'll figure this out. By the end of my first day, I had found several issues from the previous wirer, fixed everything, and felt so accomplished. It was the best experience ever. Now, after being there for about a year, I'm the only female in the engineering department, which I now run. I have several interns that work with me, and pretty much on a daily basis, I don't know what I'm going to do. We do a lot of custom builds and custom work at my job, which could be anything from figuring out how this person is going to go underwater and attach carabiner hooks to rings that are not stationary to pick up a plane off the bottom of the water. That's one of our current to figuring out, okay, now I need this person's vehicle to spin in a circle, but they want limited amount of motors. So for me, it's kind of doing everything. Again, it's a small company, so I do shipping, receiving, I'm a project manager, I do building, design work, um, pretty much anything you can think of cleaning, I do it. So I just wanna say that going back to school taking a different career path was one of the best decisions I ever made and would do it again in a heartbeat. I'm so happy with where I am now that I wouldn't change it. Thank you. Our next panelist is Aaron Greco, who is a biostatistician I can even say it, biostatistician, 
two at the Center for Statistical Sciences um, School of Public Health at Brown University. In her position, she is involved in all aspects of clinical research, including the development, design, and setup of clinical trials, um, to providing statistical analysis for medical research studies. She also plays a role in the coordination, reporting, and monitoring of clinical trials, including preparing and reviewing manuscripts for submission to medical journals, for example, New England Journal of Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Erin Greco. for the studies, 
and they collect all the data, and it comes to us at Brown University, and then we analyze it, and we tell the doctors what it all means. So they collect the data, and they know, you know which patients should be recruited, but we tell them what everything means. Thank you. I'm going to pause again and uh, take a few questions from the audience. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, once the question is asked, I'll repeat it through the microphone so that the rest of the audience can hear. Yes. So this question is for Courtney. What college did you go to and what was it like? I went to UMaine Farmington which had a student population of 1,000, I believe. It had a one to 10 uh, male to female ratio. And let's just say there were a lot of blizzards, um, <laughs> a lot of snow days, and a normal day in the winter walking to class was negative 14 degrees. Um, but it was interesting. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Okay, so this one's for Courtney. Um, just hearing your story, like uh, about like uh, like as like being an average student in high school and just uh, like trying to figure out like what like like field you want to go to. Like that's like me right now. I don't. I am a high schooler right now. I'm a sophomore, and I don't like. I still don't know what I want to do, and I feel like I'm. I don't know. I, I don't even know what field I want to go to. So like, how do you just like? And this is for everyone too. Like, how do you have that? How do you find that passion where you just like know what you're gonna do and like you just it seems like you just really know. Like, even with all the obstacles you guys are, uh, you guys face, like you still made it through. So I don't know. This question is for Courtney, and the question is, how do you find the passion and <laughs> knowing what you want to do? Well, like I said, um, I used to enjoy sciences and science classes and everything and it was fun but I always liked doing hands-on things when I was in class like the best time when I was at UMaine Farmington was dissection um, I dissected things from starfish squids rats um, what else was there uh, eyeballs like <laughs> hands-on stuff. So I kind of like a challenge. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do in the future. I was actually kind of guided there by people around me, just knowing what I like to do in general. So it's really listening to others, like Allie had said earlier, listening to your professors. They kind of know who you are by now and will kind of give you a little science what you want to do. But even if you don't find it your first try, like I did. I mean, I went to like four or five different colleges before I figured it out, but I finally found something I'm passionate about. So I say, I actually recommend going to a community college in the beginning. You don't have to, but at least that way, when you go, you can try classes in whatever you want. And when you find something you really like, you'll know it. For me, it was just, I enjoyed going to electrical classes every single day. And that's what I look forward to. And we'll take two more questions before we move on. In the middle here. This one's also important. You said that you went back to school and you got to start an electric mechanical engineering degree. What exactly um, led you to the electric side of it rather than the mechanical? So the question was, what led you, when you went back to school for electrical, what led you to where you ended up? it was uh, program programmable logic control, which was kind of a combination of both wiring and computer software, as well as more mechanical uh, playing with the equipment. I actually enjoyed looking at the wiring diagrams and figuring out where everything was going to go. It was kind of like, I'm a little OCD also, so organization, everything was labeled, everything had a neat path to where it was going. 
the mechanical was like if something failed, I had no idea what I was doing, and I really just didn't want anything to do with it. So for me, it's just more, uh, just, I feel like the organization and just I like to see kind of like a flow. Like I can actually follow wires and figure out what he's going to do. Thank you. And one last question in the middle. This question is for um, Ali and um, Aaron? and Erin. Sorry. And the question was, um, are you happy where you where you are now um, versus your previous passion? Um, so actually, I lied to you guys just a little bit. Um, I'm quitting my job in a month. <laughs> no, but it's it's not that bad. Um, I want to be a teacher, and I want to do that. Um, so for me, I think the thing that I liked about animals the most and about research the most is really the side where we all sat around and talked about it, came up with ideas and asked questions and helped each other out. Um, so for me, education brings all of that together. And I still get to pet open animals, but they're already dead. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, I think for me, the, the clinical side of things is, is a little scary because I don't like it when things go wrong with the living creature. Um, so for me, yeah, I know I made the right choice. Um, I believe I made the right choice also. In my career, even though I'm not dealing specifically with helping animals, I actually get to see a lot of the underwater life because of what we do. Last year, in August, I was actually sent to Florida for my company. I got to visit the Florida Aquarium, and I had one of my vehicles in the tank with fishball exhibit. So it was where they schooled together in a giant ball. But there was also a turtle in there, a shark. I got to explore the aquarium by myself for a few hours before I had to do anything. I've also gone to the ocean with my company where we put the vehicle in, got to explore underwater wrecks, look at all the sea life that's down there, and review videos that our customers have taken. We actually have a few online where we're asking if anybody can identify any of the fish that we've seen. And I enjoy it because I'm dealing with them, but at the same time, I'm not doing bench tests with them, trying to figure out, like in one of my fish classes, we had a trace of fish. And I had to sit there and be like, okay, this is this fish because of this. This is this because of this. And I didn't enjoy it. So for me, this is a lot better just being a little fish. <laughs> Thank you. Our next panelist is Mondri Kuntinmati, who is the project manager with Product Implementation Group at the Akushnet Company in New Bedford, uh, Massachusetts. She began her career at Akushnet as product engineer in 1999. And since then, she has risen to her current position where she oversees the Product Implementation Group. Please join me in welcoming Mondri. Thank you. I hope you guys are still staying awake. We will be done in another 15 minutes, I hope. So I, I have a little bit of a different background um, compared to all the panelists over here. I was born in India. I came here in 1994. So just going back a little bit to being born in India. My family, my parents were not college educated, just like Dr. Anna talked about earlier. They were not college educated, but they wanted us, my sister and I, to pursue it, whatever we wanted to accomplish in life. So, um, and of course, boys were preferred in those days in our uh, culture. Boys were preferred to girls, and so girls were never expected to get into science and technology kind of areas. So, but my dad was insistent that we continued and pursue whatever we wanted to do. So I got into an undergrad program in polymer science and technology in India. And one of the reasons I pursued that path is when I was looking into engineering schools, I was always a math and science geek. But um, polymer science and technology was a fairly new field. And everybody else in my friends group were looking into electrical, civil, mechanical, 
computer science and I wanted to do something that was different, that made me stand out and look, you know, I wanted to uh, approach chemical engineering, but the college that I was looking into was, did not have chemical engineering, but they had a specialization, which is the polymer science and technology. Polymer science, just to give you guys a little brief background, is more about plastics and rubbers and thermoplastics and all that good stuff. So everything you're sitting on right now has a polymer on it. So I wanted to explore that, and it was actually a really new field in our uh, college as well. So we explored that. We kind of did a lot of experiments that nobody had ever done before. It was kind of cool because we would talk about it. No seniors for us. Ours was the first batch. It was kind of exciting to do that, kind of paving the path for the university as well. So after I graduated, um, I got into uh, National Aerospace Labs in India where uh, I was working as an intern for about six months, and then they absorbed me as a research fellow. And I was working on polymer reinforced composites for about two years. During that period, while I was working there, I looked into how I could come to the United States. I had always had this American dream of coming here, getting my master's and working, and all that good stuff. So I was working on my GRE to come here for a master's program. But raising, being raised in a culture that I was, my parents were not willing to send me here as a girl, single, it shipped me off to another country because they knew once they let me loose like that, I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad, I'd actually made a deal with my dad that after I graduated from my undergrad degree, I wanted to work for a couple of years, which is what I did at the National Aerospace Labs, and then I would um, get married because arranged marriages was what was there. So that's a different conversation on another day. <laughs> but, um, so I, I worked for two years and I was planning on coming here and got me to Lehigh University for a master's program with a full scholarship. But my dad was really hesitant to send me alone. So as it turns out, my husband was visiting to get married. and Here we are, 20 years later. So I, I got married. He was working on his microbiology at that time. So we, when we talked, we said, I said I really want to do a master's uh, degree over here. So he said, that's perfectly fine. I will support you. And once he finished his microbiology, I went back to school, the University of Detroit. Let me tell you, that was the best decision I ever made, but also the hardest thing to do. Going back to school after taking a break for three and a half years was the hardest thing to do. I had to work, I, like the other panelists here said, I worked in the morning on a research project from nine o'clock till about five, and then our evening classes would start. So our days were like 12 to 14 hour long. But you had to do it, because that's how you pay for school. There is no other way you would do that. So I got into a master's program at the University of Detroit. And the reason I picked that school, firstly, was because they gave me a full scholarship. That's always helpful. But they also had this um, uh, institute called the Polymer Institute. And one of the professors, or the guy who led the program, was called the father of polyurethanes. Of polyurethanes, um, was the field that I was really interested in in my undergrad school as well. So, of course, I, I gravitated towards him. He was my mentor for two years in my master's program and was phenomenal. One of the best things about the Palmer Institute that I had <coughs> at the university was we had, um, instead of co-ops or internship with, you know, with companies outside, we actually had companies come to the university with projects and say, we have this issue. Can you please work on this with your research students? And, and fix this problem and give us a solution. So they would go back to their company, find the solution, come back to us and say it worked or it didn't. So that kind of helped me to do presentations, write reports and you know talk to vendors, find new materials. This was all kind of exciting for me to do that. And they would have me talk to the people from the company, which was also really cool. So once while I graduated from Detroit, of course, now the next thing is to look for a job. I, uh, the other part of my problem was because I was a student, a foreign student, I only had work permit for a year. I had to find a job in that year or have to be shipped back. So I was looking really hard. One of my professors said, oh, there's a company called Titleist that's looking for um, a chemical engineer who's got polyurethane experience. So of course, immediately I faxed my resume nothing from them for about three months. So I'm looking all over the place. My husband at that time was in Houston. So I moved from Detroit to Houston since I was done with school and waiting, applying all over the place. 
And out of the loop, this uh, recruiter calls me and he says, we're looking for Manjari. I'm like, yeah, this is me, <laughs> what you got? <laughs> so he said, uh, there's this company called Titleist. I'm like, yeah, I applied to them three months ago and I didn't hear back from them. So he said, well, they're in very interested in you. Would you like to come? But in the meantime, I had already found a job in Lansing, Michigan, and I was almost there to put a rent deposit in one of the apartments there. And I said, well, you guys have to act really quick because I'm, I've got a job offer. I gotta go. <laughs> so they said, how about you guys come? You come tomorrow. And I had no plane tickets, nothing. They said, drive, take a cab, get to the airport, <laughs> buy your plane ticket, and come over here. We got you. We'll interview you the next day. So I'm like, this is kind of interesting. I'm thinking, this is exciting for me because I had never driven on a highway by myself. So I'm thinking renting a car and driving itself is a huge experience for me. So I come here, I interview, and I knew during the interview that I had nailed a job. I knew I got it. So, of course, they wouldn't tell me. <laughs> so I, I, I go back, and I'm, I'm waiting, and I told my husband, I think I got this job. What are we going to do? Because he's in Houston, and I'm in Massachusetts. He said, Massachusetts is great for a medical field because he's a microbiologist. Yeah. So he said, let's go. Let's go to Massachusetts. So I'm waiting on them to call me. And of course, since I had this really strong gut feeling that I did get the job, I was waiting to, for them to call. And once they called and said, okay, this is what we're gonna offer you. This is one thing I want you guys to take away. When you think you have the upper hand, negotiate. <laughs> you absolutely have to, which is one of the things I did. So we went back and forth a couple of times and here I am. The funny thing about this getting a job at Titleist is I, I worked as a polyurethane chemist. I was synthesizing, making materials, and all that good stuff. But I had not seen a golf ball until I interviewed for the job. This is another thing you need to take away from. Even if you don't know anything about it, you will learn about it. So put your mind to it, and you'll absolutely get to it. So I came, and I interviewed. I said, I don't know what a golf ball looks like. I didn't know there were different kinds of golf balls, different <laughs> materials that go into completely blank. But here I am. I, I've been in a Krishna company for about 15 years now. And I, I, I'm now a project manager. I work on product implementation in Ball Plan 2, Ball Plan 3, work with Kim Francis all the time. It is, it is really exciting, one of the best jobs and the only job I've ever had in the United <laughs> States. I think it's, it's pretty exciting. That's all I got. Thank you. Our last panelist is Joanne Pelletier, who is the Vice President of Information Technology Services here at Bristol Community College. Ms. Pelletier has been with BCC since 2005. She began her career at BCC as the Director of Administrative Computing and Information Services, and currently holds the position of Vice President of Information Technology Services. Please join me in welcoming Joanne Pelletier. But that's okay. I, I look young, don't I? <laughs> so I grew up in nearby Swansea, a couple towns over. My mom was a single mom. We didn't have lots of money. So to me, my career was I was going to be a hairdresser. Because back then, big hair was big <laughs> and required lots of hairspray. I thought, well, you know, that's a great thing. I always enjoyed visiting with my aunt and my uncle. They were very worldly. My uncle worked for Digital Equipment Corporation, which was a very big computer company back in the 80s. And they traveled the world. They lived in Switzerland for four years. They had been to the former Soviet Union. They had gone all over the place. So once they, we would go there for Thanksgiving, and one year when they had returned from Switzerland, we arrived to the house and they had one of these bad boys. This is an IBM PC Junior, which was in 1984. And I just enamored their life. I thought, well, you know, I have to have a part of this. I have to do this, because this is what will get me the life that I think that I want. Little did I know my uncle was actually a salesperson. He did really, really, really well. So he really wasn't an IT professional. He was a salesperson in that field. So ever since I was about your age, I decided I got to have a piece of this. So I decided I was going to be a programmer, because that's really all there was back then. I wasn't going to be an engineer. I wasn't going to build computers that were about the size of this room. I was going to be a programmer. It was very big up and coming. So I decided, you know, not having lots of money, needing financial aid, that I would come to BCC. 
I probably wasn't the best student in high school. I probably didn't find my way until towards the end, although I ended up doing very, very well here. And I thought I'd be a programmer. You know, I was going to sit in a room, um, even though I'm a pretty social person, I was going to sit in a room and I was going to code all day. So when I graduated from BCC, I graduated with honors, I transferred to Rhode Island College and I enrolled in their computer information systems program, which at the time was a mix of programming and business. So I attended classes with folks that were interested in business, they were business majors, as well as classes that were programmish, but not necessarily really, really geeky. So after about a year of that, I said, heck, for another year, I can stay and get my computer science degree. I might as well, you know, who knows what's happening in the job market. So that was a huge benefit. Probably the, the biggest benefit that I probably can say I did in my own career is that because I'm a manager now, and, but I'm responsible for technical folks, I would go to classes with the CIS students who were very businessy projects, group work, and then I'd go to this other building that was all out geeks. That's all they did was they were there all day on the terminals coding. But it was actually probably the best thing that I would have ever done because I, I could talk the talk and I could walk the walk. So I was able to be in both worlds. I graduated in 1992 with my bachelor's degree and it was a good time in the economy. I was offered four jobs. Lots of, you know, I went on interviews with folks that had gone to lots of different institutions and I think because I was a female, an under, underrepresented you know, person in that field, and I had also worked at Rhode Island College, which had given me lots of experience with working in the business environment, I was offered four jobs. I took a job as a programmer, and they showed me to my little cubicle, which was, you know, about the size of this, and they said, here, do this. And I said, ooh, okay, so how many years in am I? You know, I'm however many years here at BCC, and then two years at Rhode Island College. This isn't for me. So three days later, I quit. I'm like, this isn't for me, I, I can't do this. So by then, this was you know June or so, I had been, all those jobs, those other jobs were gone, um, and all the jobs were pretty much gone because all the graduates had taken them. So it took me a little while um, to then get a job, but I was offered a job at a college in Franklin, and it wasn't programming, although there might be a little bit of that involved, it was actually doing a bunch of everything. Because it was a small college, I worked with users. I helped train them. Um, I would dig into a computer if I needed to. I wrote code if I needed to. So that was probably the turning point for me was working at a college and being around an environment where people want to learn. It's actually a great place if you, and I'm guessing that that's you're going somewhere to work at. It's just a great place to be. It keeps you young, you see. Younger kids have come every year, they look younger, but it's actually a great environment to be in. So being at a college, I knew I needed to go to college. I needed to get my master's degree. So I went to Boston University, I got my master's degree in computer information systems, which again, I already knew that I was not necessarily a programmer, but that was again a mix of business as well as technology. And then, you know, I'd been at, at, at the college in Franklin for five or six years, and a job came up here. And I said, oh, this is the homecoming. This is perfect. I'm going to go back where I came from. And I can tell you it was a little awkward at first, because here I am working with folks that I, you know, that were my teachers. But it has been the best thing that I could ever do. The best and worst parts of my job are the best and worst parts of my job. I have to worry about all of the things that you see, all the computer labs, the telephones, um, the systems, so like systems at your schools where you can log on and see your grades, like my kids can see their grades, I'm responsible for all of that. And it's good when it's good, and it's bad when it's bad. There are many, many of all-nighters that one must pull in order to be in this field, but it is actually very rewarding when you get to see the successful um, parts or aspects of your job. If I was to do it again, because when I did it, like I said, there was only really this, and this was, this was amazing. This was 1% of what you have in an iPhone 16 gig, which some of you probably have well beyond a 16 gig iPhone. So I advise students each semester in the CIS program, and a lot of times it's lots of options now. You know, back then there was this. Now there's networking, there's information security, there's, the field is humongous. Um, so when I talk to students who don't necessarily know what they want to do, I talk about what I feel I would choose if I was to go back to school, and that would be information security and forensics. 
You don't go a day without hearing about the government and what's happening here and what's happening there. I've personally worked with the FBI on a case and they employ lots of folks with information security and it is super interesting and it is um, fruitful both monetarily, personally. Um, I think that if I was to go back, I would super enjoy working in that field because it's, it's, it's hot right now. So that's my story. Thank you. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes remaining for questions. Um, so I'm gonna open it up to the audience. Yes, in the middle. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, in the middle. This is for Manjari and Kimberly. As women of color, do you feel like you had less or more support in the STEM program? Um, let, let me take that one. I'm just not a woman of different color. I'm also from a completely different culture. I, I think um, the way I look at it, when I first got to Titleist, I'm also the only female engineer in the research and development group. So it's, it, it is definitely isolating at times, but I, 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 I think I wear that confidence in me saying that I am who I am. I'm going to compete with myself and not anybody else. This is one of the things I think is very important for kids to understand. We're always still competing against each other. You, what you need to do is focus on who you are and how far you can go. Getting ahead of where you were yesterday is what your goal should be. I try my best not to let anybody, whatever they say, affect me, kind of dust it off and say it doesn't matter. It just defines who they are and not who you are. So stay focused on your path and if a color, accent, nothing will matter. You will just move on forward, okay? I think I would uh, repeat some of that from, from Anjari. You do have to stay focused. Uh, you do have to let other people's opinions of you go off your back, especially if you have your own uh, gateway and your own path to go forward in. Everybody has bouts of self-confidence, you know, whether or not they think they've done this right or not. Again, do your research. Make sure you come in with all the information you need to be forward and to be successful in whatever presentation or whatever um, uh, you know, hypothesis you put forward. That's really what it's all about. Thank you. Yes. And he said, 
find out this question for me, whatever you get, come back, we'll move on from there. So I was probably in his office once a week for my first year, and then by my last year, maybe once every two months, once I knew what I was doing. So really, if you choose a boss that's gonna help you, you know, you can get that help when you need it, and then once you have that independence, you can do it yourself. Thank you. Yes, in the middle. Yes. Oh, this is a question for Eric. Uh, being a math teacher for the amount of years that you have been, uh, most would have just settled, but if you wanted to go on and you know, pursue your dream, what, well, my question is what made you, uh, you know, bring up that motivation or you know, go to the, 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 the join out? Um, I'd say it was just, you know, being overall unhappy when I came home at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, I, not totally unhappy, just feeling like, is this it? And I always knew I wanted to do do something with math, not just teach it. Um, and it was really, I feel like, you know, going as a high school student and undergrad student, I didn't really know what I could do with math then. Um, I don't know, I mean, I did go to undergrad many years ago, so maybe that's changed, but when I went, they, they really seemed to have their own agenda as to what they wanted to push math students to do. And I had to kind of, on my own, after being a teacher for so long, say, I, I want to do something else. And I had to, you know, thankfully at Google, and I went online and searched all these different programs. Um, and just, you know, medicine always called me, and I knew I didn't want to go to med school, but, um, you know, what I do is kind of like a, a mesh between medicine and math, and it works.
So we had a situation where I needed to work directly with them on some activity that had been happening at the college. And I have to say, it's super interesting. You know, if, again, if I, you know, information security on the front end is where you build systems and protocols to protect information technology environments. And forensics on the back end is trying to figure out what happened if something happened. And if you watch the news every day, it seems to happen almost every day. So there's, it's, it's a great field to be in. In terms of my field and talking about being, you know, how do you know when you reach your full potential, if you decide to go into the information technology field, you can never be done. You must always, you know, from the time that I was at, started at Bristol in 1998, I can tell you we look like a completely different environment technologically wise than we did back then. And that's what kind of keeps you going is the fact that you can never know that you're done. You're always continuing to change. And that's a good thing. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to turn the mic back over to Megan, who is going to um, let you know what's next. So thank you. Thank you.